Hey everyone, Shanox here and welcome to my Salty Rogue PvP guide for Shadowlands Season 1. As it is the first season of a new expansion, I wanted to reach 2.4 in both brackets, as well as get the Gladiator title for this season, before releasing a guide. The idea was to get enough Shadowlands experience to be able to offer valuable insight on how to play Sub Rogue in Shadowlands. Now that these objectives have been achieved, I can finally make my guide. I've been working on it quite a bit, so if you like it, please let me know by leaving a like or a comment, and if you do not like it, or find that something is missing, let me know too, as it helps me improve the quality of my content. And now, let's get started with the guide. In this video, I will cover the following topics. Stat priority and gearing, talents and hunter talents, covenants, conduits, legendaries, gameplay, macros and arena comps. Let's begin with stat priority and gearing. As a sub rogue in PvP, your stat priority is versatility, mastery, critical strike and haste. Versatility increases all your damage done and reduces all of your damage taken. It is a stat that makes you more deadly and also more resilient. In addition, there is a PvP set bonus on PvP trinkets that increases the damage and healing benefit of versatility by 40%, increasing the value of versatility even more. Be careful, this is not plus 40% damage, it is plus 40% of your versatility value in damage. For instance, I have around 28% Versa, so the set bonus gives me 40% of that in damage, which is around 11%. Mastery increases the damage done by your finishing moves, so Eviscerate, Rupture, Black Powder and Secret Technique. As a sub rogue, you will kill people with Eviscerate on your goes, so a stat that directly increases its damage is pretty good. Critical Strike will only be picked if you do not have access to a piece of gear with versatility and mastery on it. It is not a terrible stat as having big crits on Eviscerate helps a lot, but it is not consistent and so not as good as versatility or mastery. Haste is your least desired stat, and if possible you want to have none of it. It increases the tick rate of rupture, the speed of your auto attacks and your energy regeneration. But you do not care about the tick rate of rupture, you have slice and dice for your auto attack speed, and with slice and dice plus shadow techniques, master of shadows, relentless strikes and symbols of death, you already have more than enough energy on your goes. Regarding gearing, the PvP vendor sells a lot of versatility mastery items. However, on a few slots he will only sell you either a critverse item or a hasteverse item. In that case, you want to pick the critverse item unless you get lucky on your vault and get a 226 verse mastery item on that slot from either raiding or mythic plus. About weapons, the best weapons in the game right now are the PvP ones as you can upgrade them to 233 if you reach elite. You need a dagger in main hand, and for your offhand it does not really matter. You can pick a slower offhand if you have one with better item level or better stats, but a dagger will work slightly better with slice and dice and shadow techniques because if you attack faster, then you are more likely to get shadow techniques to proc. Again, in PvP the difference is almost not noticeable, so you can really go with whatever you like the most. About trinkets, I recommend using two PvP trinkets for the set bonus. The only non-PvP trinket that could be used is the one from Shriekwing, but now that health pools have gone up, it does not really want on people, and in 3s it can be hard to have it hit the right target. In any case, I prefer the consistency of the PvP trinkets. As a sub rogue, for your first trinket, you will either pick Gladiator's Badge if you want an offensive trinket, which is what I play most of the time, or you will pick Gladiator's Emblem if you want a defensive trinket. Your second trinket has to be a CC trinket. As a rogue, it is of utmost importance to have a way out of stuns. If you are not a human, you need to pick Gladiator's Medallion. If you are a human, then you can go with a Relentless Trinket. You have a way out of stuns with your human ratio, will to survive every 3 minutes, and with a Relentless Trinket you reduce the duration of all incoming CC by 20%, which is very powerful in PvP. So the rule is, not human, play Medallion. Human, play Relentless. The only exception to that rule is if you are a human and you are playing double DPS in 2s. In that case, you need to equip a medallion instead of relentless, as you need to be able to trinket any sort of CC to seize a kill opportunity. Alright, now let's have a look at our talents and honor talents. As a salty rogue, you always want to play premeditation, mark for death, prey on the weak, enveloping shadows, and master of shadows. The only talents that you might swap around are subterfuge and night stalker and Elusiveness and Soothing Darkness. Typically, you want to play Elusiveness and Subterfuge if you are playing 3s or 2s with a healer and you want to play Soothing Darkness and either Subterfuge or Night Stalker if you are playing double DPS in 2s. I prefer to play Subterfuge always, but Night Stalker is also viable in that double DPS scenario. 
Regarding Hunter's Islands, you always want to play Smoke Bomb, Cold Blood and Shadowy Duel. Now let's have a closer look at our talents. On the first row you have Weapon Master, Premeditation and Gloomblade. You will never pick Gloomblade, it replaces Backstab, does very little damage and you don't really care about your damage out of Shadow Dance anyways. Weapon Master gives you a low chance to duplicate your Shadow Strikes, which means double damage and also double combo points. However, it is RNG so you can't rely on it. It can be a fun talent to play into with a healer though. The remaining talent, Premeditation, allows you to get your Slice and Dice buff at the start of every go without having to spend combo points or a GCD for it. Slice and Dice makes your auto attacks faster, which increases your energy regeneration through the passive shadow techniques, so it's great to have it up. Also, if you already have Slice and Dice up after your opener and get a second go, this talent will allow your first shadow strike to give you 4 combo points, so you can kidney shot a healer, cheap shot a DPS for 1 combo point and shadow strike for 4, allowing you to use eviscerate already. You want to pick this talent in all PvP scenarios. On the second row you have Night Stalker, Subterfuge and Shadow Focus. You will never pick Shadow Focus in PvP. It simply reduces the energy cost of your spells while in Shadow Dance, but you don't really need that as you only use Dance for goes with either Symbols of Death, a full energy bar, or both. Night Stalker is a decent talent, it gives you 8% more damage in Shadow Dance, and not 12 as it is nerfed in PvP. Subterfuge is the most powerful talent of this row. It extends the duration of Shadow Dance, which is nice, but its strength lies in the fact that it allows you to use your stealth-based abilities for 3 seconds after stealth breaks. That means that if you get found in stealth, you can still stun or sap people for 3 seconds without using a Shadow Dance. Same thing if you catch a re-stealth mid-game and you reopen without Shadow Dance, and same thing when you reopen after Vanish. As a rogue, you are at your best when you have access to these stealth-based abilities, so having a way to access them without blowing Shadow Dance is very powerful. You will almost always, if not always, pick this talent. On the third row you have Vigor, Dipper Stratagem and Marked for Death. Vigor gives you more energy regeneration and as I already said you don't need that as salty. Dipper Stratagem is uh, actually a powerful PvE talent that can be fun in toot with a healer as it allows your kidney shot to last for 7 seconds. This would be the only reason why you pick this talent. However, the last option on this row, Mark for Death, is simply more powerful. It gives you 5 combo points with a short cooldown, that allows you to either fit an additional eviscerate into your burst, or kidney shot a target when you don't have any combo point. You will always pick this talent. On the 4th row you have Soothing Darkness, Cheat Death and Elusiveness. If you play double DPS in 2s, then you pick Soothing Darkness. The reason for this is that as a sub rogue in a double DPS comp, you want to go away and re-stealth between every go. Since you do not have a healer, this talent will heal the damage you took while trying to get away while you're waiting for your DRs to fall off so you can go again. Cheat Death is a terrible talent in PvP scenarios. You only use this in PvE, but never in PvP. The last option on this row is the one that you will use the most. Elusiveness allows your Feint to give you a 30% damage reduction buff for 5 seconds, and Feint only has a 15 second cooldown, so you will have access to the defensive a lot. This talent is probably the most powerful talent available to rogues overall if you use it well. To get the most value out of it, you want to use it just before a stun on you such as Lasso, Kidney Shot or Stormbolt, or simply when the enemy team has very high damage, such as during Fist of Fury or Bladestorm. On the 5th row you have Shot in the Dark, Night Terrors and Prey on the Weak. Shot in the Dark makes your next cheap shot free after you use Stealth or Shadow Dance. You don't really need that. Night Terrors causes your Shuriken Storm to slow your targets by 30%. Honestly, I don't know why this talent still exists, as we now have Crippling Poison and it can also be applied with Shuriken Storm, so that makes this talent totally useless. That leaves you with the last option, Prey on the Weak. It increases the damage taken by anything you stun by 5% in PvP instead of 10. This isn't much, but it is still 5% more damage, so you just pick this talent. On the 6th row, you have Dark Shadow, Alacrity and Enveloping Shadows. Alacrity just gives you haste and you need uptime on the target to keep the buff up, so it is a useless talent that you will never pick at all as a sub row. Dark Shadow causes Shadow Dance to increase all your damage by 30%. This sounds big, but Shadow Dance already increases your damage done by 15% baseline without this talent, so this talent does not actually give you 30% extra damage, it simply changes the 15% extra damage from Shadow Dance to a 30% extra damage. Not a bad talent, but the last option on this row, Enveloping Shadows, is much, much better. 
It gives you a second charge of Shadow Dance, and it also causes the passive Deepening Shadows to reset your Shadow Dance cooldown faster. So with this talent you are able to use Shadow Dance a lot more often. You can even use it every single DR, which means that you will have it every go. And sometimes you can even use your second Shadow Dance to keep the damage going after a go, as you reset the first charge for the next go in doing so. Currently, you always pick this talent in every kind of content. On the last row you have Master of Shadows, Secret Technique and Trick and Tornado. You have no need for an AoE finisher in PvP, so you can rule out Secret Technique. You also do not have need of a talent that would use Shuriken Storm 4 times, so you can rule out Shuriken Tornado. You are left with only one option, Master of Shadows. This talent is good as it gives you 25 energy when you enter Shadow Dance. It isn't much, but it is a bit of energy free when you start to go. About Hana talents, Smoke Bomb, Cold Blood and Shadowy Duel are much more powerful than the rest. There are other interesting talents such as Maneuverability or a Death From Above, but you can't really pick them as the three talents I mentioned just before are too powerful not to pick. Smoke Bomb allows you to secure a kill on the target that does not have a trinket. It can also be used defensively to prevent a cast from killing you or your teammates, or to prevent CC on your healer that would result in your death. Cold Blood is just more damage um, every second go. It has a 1 minute cooldown and deals 10% of the enemy's health when you use it. It is a very powerful spell that will give you the extra damage you need to kill people. And the last one, Shadowy Duel, is one of the most powerful talents rogues ever had. I even think that it's a bit too powerful currently and that it wouldn't be surprising if one day it was removed from the game. If you use this on an enemy, you and that enemy are faced together and no one else can see or attack you. The enemy you duel can no longer target his team or be targeted by his team so he cannot heal or be healed unless an ability like Spirit Link or Radiance is used, as AoE effects still hit people in and out of Shadowy Duel. However, since Shadowlands pre-patch for some reason, your team is able to see you while in Shadowy Duel, so if you get CC'd you can be dispelled, if the enemy you duel suddenly hits you, you can be healed. I don't think that it should work like this, but it currently does so it doesn't hurt to know it. It is also important to know that you and your enemy both have true sight in the duel. That means if another rogue uses Vanish in the duel, you can see him, sub him or kill him. It also means that if you use Vanish in your own shadowy duel, the enemy, can, uh, the enemy you dueled can still see you and attack you, so do not waste Vanish that way. So this was a quick explanation on how shadowy duel works. Now the reason why it is very powerful is because it has many uses. You can duel the target on low health when their healer comes out of CC to land a kill, as the enemy healer will not be able to heal in Shadowy Duel unless he uses an AoE heal that do not require a target such as Spirit Link or Radiance. You can also duel the enemy healer after a CC chain to allow your team to finish off the enemy DPS if you have used all of your damage. You can also duel an enemy that would land a CC on your healer that would be a problem for your team, so the CC never lands. You can also duel an enemy that is about to kill one of your teammates to save them. As you can see, this spell is very powerful both offensively and defensively. And the best part is that unlike any other CC that you would use for the same result, Shadowy Duel cannot be trinketed, so it is guaranteed to last for its full duration unless the target uses Divine Shield or Ice Block. And this is why it is so good. Alright, time to talk about Covenants. There are four Covenants available. Kyrian, Nightfair, Necrolord and Venthyr. I chose to be Kyrian on my main rogue despite the nerfs and I have my second rogue as Nightfair. I think that both options are good, but I prefer Kyrian at the moment. You will never pick Venthyr as a rogue and Necrolord is, in my opinion, a bit weaker than Kyrian or Nightfair, but is still an okay choice. Now about Kyrian vs Nightfair, even though Echoing Reprimand does not one shot people anymore, I think that it is still a good spell, at least better than Sepsis. It gives 2 combo points on a short cooldown, costs only 10 energy and potentially gives you a 7 combo point eviscerate, which is a lot of damage. However, the Soul Shape ability from the Night Fae is better than the Curian Potion. Soul Shape allows you to run away and re-stealth a lot more easily which is great in comps such as a Rogue Mage in 2s or Rogue Mage Priest in 3s. The Curian Potion is still a very good spell as it heals you for quite a bit and dispels dangerous debuffs. In the end, I think that both of these covenants are currently strong for sub rogues, so you may choose the one you prefer. In my case, I prefer Kyrian. I know that other high-rated rogues such as Peekaboo also prefer Kyrian, while other high-rated rogues such as Nage prefer Nightfae. 
One thing to take into account when talking about covenants is that we do not currently have access to all the soulbinds and all the passives. So one covenant might be the best, but we don't know it yet as we don't have access to what would make it the best. Time to talk about conduits. Conduits are very similar to talents, but less flexible as they can only be changed in your covenant sanctum. I will not go over every single conduit we have as some of them are really useless. Instead, I'll focus on the conduits that are powerful in PvP. First on the list is Cloaked in Shadows. Cloaked in Shadows is an endurance conduit that gives you a rather big shield when you enter stealth. The reason why this conduit is so powerful, perhaps even our most powerful conduit, is because it allows you to re-stealth with dots. As long as the shield holds and absorbs the damage of any dot you may have on you, your stealth won't break. This is particularly strong in any double DPS comp in 2s, so Rogue Mage, Rogue Hunter and so on, as you can re-stealth every single go without having to use Cloak of Shadows to remove long-lasting dots. It also is powerful in 3s for the same reason. It will often allow you to re-stealth while your healer is buzzy and can't dispel you, or is in CC, as the shield will keep you safe from dot damage. In addition, it improves Vanish as a defensive cooldown, since your stealth usually will hold after the Vanish buff is over, thanks to the shield. In my opinion, this conduit is a must-have, and you should always play it. Another good conduit is Recuperator. It is also an endurance conduit, and gives you a small healing of a time effect tied to Slice and Dice. While this is not a crazy amount of healing, it is still okay for a class like Rogue that has little self-healing. It will slightly help your healer to heal sustained damage on you, but will not save you from big hits. Of course, this conduit works with the Slice and Dice buff given by Premeditation as well as the normal Slice and Dice. I think it's really good to play with this conduit most of the time. Quick Decisions, a finesse conduit, is also a very good pick that many people undervalue. It reduces the cooldown of Shadow Step and increases its range. Having more range on Shadow Step is incredibly useful. Many people are used to the 25 yards range and will therefore try to outrange it if they can in order to avoid being kicked or stunned. By having a longer range on your Shadow Step you can catch them when they don't expect it, which can win you a game. The cooldown reduction is also great for a similar reason. Many people track the cooldown of mobility spells such as Shadow Step, Blink and so on in order to know when it is safe for them to get closer without you interrupting them or stunning them. By having Shadow Step back when they think it is still on cooldown for a few seconds, you can catch them completely unaware and secure a kill. Two other finesse conduits are decent, but I haven't used them a lot yet. These two conduits are Rushed Setup and Prepared for All. Rushed Setup is good because it reduces the energy cost of Cheap Shot, which can sometimes be useful in GOES when you need to Cheap Shot multiple enemies. However, you rarely have energy issues on your GOES, and you don't always have to use Cheap Shot enough to be out of energy. So, this conduit will not always be useful. Prepared for all allows you to reduce the cooldown of evasion if you dodge attacks, and reduce the cooldown of Cloak of Shadows if you land kicks. While it is certainly decent, it looks much better than it actually is. When you use evasion in arena, people will usually stop attacking you and go for your teammates instead, so you will not benefit from the first part of this conduit much versus good players. The only exception to this would be Windwalker monks, as their celestial and their clones might keep attacking you during evasion, giving a lot of value to the conduit. The second part of the conduit is a bit better as it is entirely up to you to get value out of it, and can be good against double casters. Overall it looks like an okay conduit versus anything as you get your cloak back faster versus casters, and evasion back faster versus melees. I would, however, only play this in 3s as you will get more value out of it. Indeed, there will be more people here to attack you through evasion, and more people will be here casting spells that you can interrupt. Keep in mind that it is very powerful in World of Warcraft to have tools that reduce the cooldown of your important spells, because that prevents the enemy team from knowing when your cooldowns are back up, and that might make them do mistakes. For example, let's say you kicked successfully 3 times after using Cloak of Shadows versus a mage. Then, with this conduit, you will reduce the cooldown of Cloak of Shadows by about 15 seconds. A fire mage could very well decide to use Combustion on you outside of a stun, with a polymorph on your healer because he thinks that you get your cloak back in 15 seconds, but you have it back already and you just immune his combustion, so he wastes it. To finish up with conduits, we have Potency Conduits. Sadly, as Salty, none of them are very powerful. The best one we have of PvP is Deeper Daggers. It increases your shadow damage done after you use Eviscerate. This works well with Shadow Blades, which is sub's burst cooldown, 
and also with the rank 2 of Eviscerate, which causes Eviscerate to deal 50% additional shadow damage on targets affected by a fine weakness. Since the rest of our potency conduits are not really good in PvP, I'd advise against playing more than one. You're better off playing only deeper daggers as potency, and then going for stuff such as Cloaked in Shadows, Recuperator, Quick Decisions, or Prepared for All. As you can see here, this is what I've decided to do. So all of my games at the moment I play with Deeper Daggers, Recuperator, and most importantly Cloaked in Shadows. Once we have unlocked the last conduit row, there will be a bit more room for customization depending on what you are facing, since you can put conduits in different paths, and then change the path before a new game starts. Alright, now let's have a look at legendaries. Just as I did for conduits, I'm only going to talk about the legendaries that I think are important. If I don't mention one, it's because I think that it is not that great for PvP, but feel free to discuss in the comments. In my opinion, we currently have two powerful options with Master Assassin and Invigorating Shadow Dust. Master Assassin gives you a 100% crit chance for 4 seconds after you leave stealth. It doesn't work with Shadow Dance, only stealth. This legendary is quite powerful as it makes your opener very threatening, allowing you to force cooldowns with ease. It also gives a lot of value to any re-stealth you can get, and in PvP as a sub rogue, you're supposed to try and re stealth as much as possible. As it happens, the conduit cloaked in shadows makes getting a re stealth a lot easier than before, so it is, in fact, not too hard to get value out of Master Assassin. Last but not least, it makes Vanish a very powerful burst cooldown, as you can simply use it during a go to get a 100% crit chance after you've CC'd everyone if you don't need it for something else. Invigorating Shadow Dust causes your Vanish to reduce all your cooldowns by 20 seconds when you use it. This is insanely powerful as it allows several different power plays. First, by reducing the cooldown of blind by 20 seconds, you will get a second blind before the enemy healer gets his trinket, allowing you to get a guaranteed blind into double sap setup without the enemy healer being able to trinket. Second, you can kidney shot a target, use mark for death, vanish, and kidney shot another target, allowing you to have a full kidney on two different targets at the same time for a very big setup. Third, you can kick a cast, then vanish, and kick again when the enemy is casting, and thinks your kick isn't available yet because you just kicked. And last, it can help you reset the cooldown on cool blood, symbols of death, or shadow dance if you see a kill opportunity coming up but lack the damage to kill your target because your spells are still on cooldown. Oh, and also, since it reduces all your cooldowns by 20 seconds, you also get your defenses back quicker. Some people often forget about that and go all in on you believing you don't have any defensives, but you actually do. As you can see, these two legendaries are very powerful and also very different. Master Assassin will simply give a lot of value to your re-stealth, your opener, and your vanish, so you just have to play normally, catch re-stealth, and you're using it well. You don't have anything special to do to play around the legendary. On the other hand, Invigorating Shadow Dust is a bit trickier to use as you need to play around it and be extremely good at managing multiple cooldowns as well as anticipating situations in order not to waste the effect when you press Vanish. I personally prefer Master Assassin at the moment, so it's the one I crafted and the one I push Gladiator with. Once I get enough Sulash, I will also craft Invigorating Shadow Dust as I really want to try it on the ladder. Now, you can pick whichever you prefer. As I said, both are really good. I know some high rated rogues such as Peekaboo prefer Master Assassin, like me, while other equally high rated rogues such as Nash or Waz prefer Invigorating Shadow Dust. I saw many people asking about Finality and Ikari in PvP. I assume many people have those because they are great in PvE. However, their damage is spread over an entire fight and doesn't really help either with Burst like Master Assassin or with setups like Invigorating Shadow Dust. They do add a bit of damage to your Shadow Dance but not enough to pass up on the power of the two legendaries I recommended just before. Alright, time to talk about gameplay. Here, I'll describe the opener, the burst rotation, and what to do in between your burst windows. I'll try to have this part of the guide as detailed as possible, as openers and burst windows are one of the most important aspects of a sub rogue. Before I start, you need to be aware of two things. First, as a sub rogue, you do not have unhealable damage like some other melees have, such as Windwalker. Instead, you have high damage during short windows, and your strength lies in the fact that you do it while stunning your target, preventing them from using a defensive, CCing you, or healing themselves. 
Therefore, it is extremely important that you do not leave any gap between your stunts when attempting to kill someone. Second, because CC is so important as subrogue, you have to pay attention to the race and trinket of your enemies. Orcs have a passive racial that reduces the duration of all stun effects on them by 20%, and the relentless trinket does the same with all types of CC. This will change your rotation against orcs or relentless enemies if you want to leave no gaps between your stuns. Now, the openers. The opener that you will perform the most is the following one. Sub someone, then use shadow blades, cold blood, cheap shot, shadow dance, symbols of death, on your string dip, echoing reprimand or just shadow strike if you aren't carrying, eviscerate, mark for death, eviscerate, cheap shot, shadow strike, and then either you eviscerate if that kills the enemy, or you cheap shot and then eviscerate. This opener requires all your cooldowns and is the most damage you can do as a sub row currently. You can also open without shadow blades if you don't have it or if you need to keep it for a later go. In that case you will sub someone, then use cheap shot, shadow dance, symbols of death, cold blood on your trinket, echoing or permanent, shadow strike, or just shadow strike twice if you are in Kyrian, eviscerate, cheap shot, shadow strike, cheap shot, eviscerate. In that opener without shadow blades, you can notice that I did not include Mark for Death, as it allows you to keep it. But you can also use it, and instead of the second cheap shot, you do Mark for Death, Kidney Shot, and then Shadow Strike twice, Cheap Shot, Eviscerate. This will let you use an additional Shadow Strike while keeping the target stunned. As you can see, this is just one opener, and I was already able to show you three different versions of it. And there are more, because if your target is an orc or has Relentless, then everything is different as your stuns don't last as long. For example, with Shadow Blades, on an orc or a Relentless target, you'd want to use Shadow Blades, Cold Blood, Cheap Shot, Shadow Dance, Symbols of Death, on your Trinket, Echoing Reprimand or a Shadow Strike if you are in Kyrian, Eviscerate, wait 0.2 seconds for the Cheap Shot to be over and then Mark for Death Kidney Shot, Shadow Strike, when 0.4 a second for the Kidney Shot to be over, then cheap shot, eviscerate. As I said before, there will be other versions of that opener too, if you don't have shadow blades or mark for death. Because there are so many ways to open a sub or burst your target depending on the situation, you want to think of your rotation as a priority system instead of an actual rotation. First, get CC on the enemy healer or on any target that would stop your go immediately. Arms warriors are good examples of that as they can just use intervene on every go if they are not in CC. Sap or Kidney Shot are good ways of getting CC on healers or secondary targets of importance. Second, if your target is not stunned, then make sure you stun it, and do not let any gaps between the stuns. That means if the target trinkets, stun again even if you have 5 combo points. It also means do not use an ability that would put you on the GCD when the stun ends, as the enemy could then use a spell while you are still on the GCD. This will happen to orcs and relentless targets as I showed just before, which is why on my spell sequence I said wait for the stun to end and restun, because at that point if you don't wait and use another spell, the stun will end before you can restun. Third, if you have 4 or 5 combo points and the target is stunned and will remain stunned during at least one more GCD, then you use Eviscerate. And fourth, when the target is stunned, will remain stunned for your next GCD at least, and you don't have enough combo points to use Eviscerate, then you use Shadow Strike. As you can see, using Shadow Strike is the last thing you have to think about. Many new players make the mistake of pressing Shadow Strike too much and stuns not enough, because they are kind of excited that Shadow Strike is available, they want to do damage, and so they use it. You have to remember that as a sub rogue, if the enemy isn't in CC, you're just not going to kill, unless you're fighting players who do not know how to react but it's best to assume that you always face someone who is good at the game and play accordingly. Back on the topic of openers, there is a second opener that you will have to use a lot if you play Rogue Mage or RMP. Sometimes, your kill target could react right after you sub their healer before you stun them. For example, a Windwalker monk could use Fortifying Brew once you sub their healer in a 2v2, making it a lot less likely for you to kill them or force cooldowns with your opener. To prevent that from happening, you want to sub the kill target, then walk to the healer in stealth, use Mark for Death, Kidney Shot, and then Shadow Blades, cheap shot the DPS with Subterfuge, Shadow Dance, Symbols of Death, on your screen get a current reprimand, or Shadow Strike if you are in Kyrian, Eviscerate, Shadow Strike, Cheap Shot, Eviscerate, Cheap Shot, Shadow Strike, Eviscerate. 
Of course, if you don't commit Shadow Blades or if the target is an orc or has Relentless, this opener changes once again. I'm not going to detail every single one of those situations, but since I showed you the priority order for your spells, you should now be able to adapt and design the best opener if you find yourself in one of these situations. Now, the burst rotation. The burst rotation is actually very similar to your openers. Since you're in combat, you want to start with a kidney shot on the healer as you can't sap him, but you don't need to use marked for death for it as you will get your combo points while in the fight. So the burst rotation is kidney shot on the target you need to CC, often the healer, shadow blades, shadow dance, cold blood, symbols of death, on you trinket, cheap shot, echoing or permanent or shadow strike if you are in Kyrian, eviscerate, marked for death, eviscerate, cheap shot, shadow strike and either eviscerate if you kill, or a cheap shot again and then eviscerate if you don't. Once again, you will have to adapt if you don't use shadow blades or if there is an orc or a relentless target. One thing to keep in mind, sometimes it will actually be valuable to wait until after the first cheap shot to use symbols of death, in order to take advantage of the energy symbols gives you. It doesn't really matter if you use shadow blades as you will generate more combo points, which leads to more finishes, which in turn leads to more energy thanks to the passive Relentless Strikes. But if you don't use Shadow Blades, energy might be an issue near the end of your spell sequence, so be sure to use symbols when you take advantage of it fully. Another burst rotation you will sometimes do is when you go for a healer or when your team gets CC on the enemy healer for you so you still have your kidney shot. In that case, you want to kidney shot the kill target, use Shadow Blades, Shadow Dance, Cold Blood, Symbols of Death, Oni Trinket, Echoing Reprimand or Shadow Strike if you are in Kyrian, Shadow Strike again, Eviscerate, Marked for Death, Eviscerate, Shadow Strike, Sheep Shot, Eviscerate, Sheep Shot, Shadow Strike, Eviscerate. And I'll repeat it once more, if you don't have Shadow Blades or if the target is an orc or has Relentless, you need to adapt your spell sequence. There is one thing that I haven't mentioned that affects your burst. You have a passive called Shadow Techniques. It will randomly give you a combo point when you go to attack someone. So, in some of the openers or bursts that I showed, sometimes I say, use Shadow Strike twice. When I say this, those two Shadow Strikes are supposed to get you 5 combo points to then use Eviscerate. But sometimes, you will, you will use the first of these Shadow Strikes, so you are 3 combo points, and you also get your Shadow Techniques proc, so you are, in fact, at 4 combo points. In that case, as I said when I explained the spell priority, you should use Eviscerate and not the second Shadow Strike. So be sure to watch your combo points at all times if you want to do maximum damage. And to conclude on the burst rotation and the opener, what I'm showing here are the most simple rotations. When in an arena, you will often need to save GCDs and energy to stun the third target or to resub the healer. So you have to keep in mind that in the end, you need to become able to manage CC duration on several targets while optimizing your combo point and energy usage while also doing damage to the kill target and then you'll be doing great. Now, the last thing I want to talk about regarding gameplay is what to do in between your burst windows. As a sub-rogue, the very first thing you need to ask yourself when a go is over is, can I go away and get a re-stealth? If you get a re-stealth, then it will be much easier to set up your next go as the enemy team can't see you. Also, if you play the legendary Master Assassin, you will get a ton more damage from getting a re-stealth. However, you need to be careful when you go re-stealth and make sure that your team does not need your help to survive, because if you go away to re-stealth and that causes your team to die, well, you're in stealth, that's great, but you just lost the game anyway. If you can't catch a re-stealth, then you want to apply Rupture on your kill target and slice and dice to yourself. That will be a bit of extra damage for the next go and also happens to be your best sustained damage. And then, you want to prepare 5 combo points so you can go again with a kidney shot in the healer when the DRs are over. And then you're back to your burst rotation. I'm aware that this part of the guide was kind of long and maybe a bit boring if you already knew most of that stuff, but the opener and the shadow dance windows are extremely important as subs, so I wanted to give as much detail as possible so that anyone listening to this knows what to do. I just hope that I wasn't too confusing. Time to have a look at macros. People often ask me stuff about macros, it's very simple really. As a rogue, the only macros that you need are macros that allow you to CC enemies without dropping your current target, and also a sub macro. You can either use target arena macros or focus macros. 
I prefer and I also recommend focus macros. You have so many spells that you want to be able to use on off targets that if you go with target arena macros for all your spells on arena 1, arena 2 and arena 3, you'll just be drowned in keybinds. Instead, what I do is I have a keybind to focus arena 1, focus arena 2 and focus arena 3 and all my CC spells have a modifier so that they can either go on my target or on my focus. And then I make macros for my CC spells, so Sap, Blind, Cheap Shot, Kidney Shot, Kick, Shadow Step and Shiv. And also Shadowy Duel, but out of habit I actually often swap target and uh, do this one on target instead of using my macro to do it on focus. But anyways, the macros I have look like that. So, after mod you choose the modifier you want to use, so it can be Ctrl, Alt or Shift. After target equal, you choose the target that you want the spell to go on, so it can be focus, it can be the name of a player, it can be arena 1, 2, 3, it can be party 1, 2, 3. Um, then the first spell, before the semicolon, is a spell that will be used if you press the modifier and it will go on the target you specified. So here, control and focus. The spell after the semicolon is the spell that will be used if you don't press the modifier but just press your key. So, if I put this macro on a key, for example 1, then 1 will cast Cheap Shot on my target, and Control 1 will cast Cheap Shot on my focus target. Be careful, if you have something in your default UI bound on Control 1, this will not work. You have to unbin whatever you have on Control 1 in order for this to work. So, that's what I use. Um, you can use focus macros without modifiers if you like, or just put them on totally different key than the actual spell. Uh, I just like it more this way. Aside from those macros, you want to use a sap macro um, to find stealth targets. It looks like this. You can also use a sap arena 1, arena 2 and arena 3 if you like to find stealthers in arena. The last macro that I really use often is shadow step on party members. It works the same way as my focus macros that I showed earlier. Only, instead of um, target equal focus, I put target equal party 1 or target equal party 2. And that way I can shadow step to allies without targeting them. It's a bit faster than clicking the party frame and then pressing step in case you need a fast exit, but it's really not mandatory. So the sub macro is mandatory, and the macros to CC targets that aren't your targets are extremely important, if not mandatory. And you will feel it more and more as you gain rating. It allows you to manage CC much better. And also, as a rogue, there is something extra that other classes do not have to worry about. Since you can only sub targets that are out of combat, and combat requires 6 seconds to drop, if you kidney shot a target and no one does damage or dispels that target, sometimes you can sub off your kidney. If you target the guy and then press kidney shot, you will almost always auto attack him, which will delay the combat drop timer. But if you focus that target and then focus kidney, then you won't auto attack the target because you're already auto attacking your current target. So the stunned guy, the one that you just kidneyed, is more likely to drop combat for you to sap. And since you focus sap, you don't risk auto attacking it again just when you want to try and sap. So that's it for the macros. Uh, it's nothing incredible, but it really does not need to be very complicated to be important and useful. And to finish up with this guide, I'll talk about arena comps. As a rogue, in 2s you have the option to play either double DPS or DPS healer. The best double DPS comps available to you are sub rogue fire mage, sub rogue retribution paladin, sub rogue balance druid, sub rogue shadow priest and sub rogue survivor hunter. I've ranked them from what I think is best to worst, but keep in mind that all of them are viable to push decent rating. When playing those comps, as a rogue you're here to initiate CC chains on the enemy healer while also keeping the enemy DPS stunned so that your partner can do damage freely and keep the CC going. Just before the stuns on the kill target wear off, if you are not going to kill you immediately need to run away in order to avoid taking damage. Since these comps feature little to no healing, you stay alive by avoiding most of the damage and slowly healing in stealth in between your goes. Every time DRs on your targets are off, you go again. At some point, if you do it properly, the enemy team will be out of trinkets and defensive cooldowns and you will land a kill. As for the DPS hero comps, you don't have that many options. Sub Rogue Discipline Priest is the best followed by Sub Rogue Holy Paladin. All other healer Sub Rogue combinations are not doing that well right now. As a Sub Rogue, you need a healer that does damage, as some classes you just can't kill by yourself during your goes. 
your objective is to then CC on the enemy healer with a Kini shot, followed by a fear, a sub or a blinding light, and then triple sheep shot the DPS with both you and your healer doing damage in order to kill him. It is also possible to swap on the healer who doesn't have a trinket when you and your healer have damage cooldowns available and can prevent the enemy DPS from peeling. In my opinion, since the last sub rogue nerf, the best comp overall to push rating with N2v2 is Fire Mage sub rogue, and the second best is Discipline Priest sub rogue. All the other comps available to you require more effort to get rating. Regarding threes, the best comp available to you is, without surprise, RMP. As Rogue Mage Priest, you want to get CC on everyone in the enemy team at once and burst someone down. Usually, your target will be a DPS, but sometimes you will have to target healers. Whenever you don't kill, you run, reset combustion, reset shadow dance, and go again when the Rs are off. It isn't an easy comp to play really well, as you need to pay a lot of attention to many things at once in order to have perfect cross CC while doing coordinated damage on your goes. You also need to be able to recognize when someone in the enemy team is badly positioned, even just a few seconds, as RMP is a comp that needs to take advantage of that kind of little mistakes in order to land kills. Aside from RMP, you can play RPS, so Sub Rogue, Shadow Priest, Rest the Shaman, with successful results. The move is a good source of inspiration if you're looking for pointers playing that comp. I personally only played it a few times, so I'm not the most qualified person to, get, uh, to give advice on the comp. You can also play this with a Holy Paladin. Another comp that you can play is Sub Rogue Survivor Haunter Discipline Priest. It is kind of similar to Rogue Mage, you want to stun the enemy healer into a Freezing Trap Fear combo while you cheap shot and nuke one of the DPS. It isn't as good as RMP and you need to play better to make it work in the current meta, but it's definitely viable although not part of the best comps. It also works with a Marksmanship Hunter, but I think it isn't as good, even though you have better burst. I haven't seen or played any other rogue comp that consistently performs well this season, although you could probably play with a balanced druid and either a holy priest or a dis um, holy paladin sorry, and a disciplined priest and do quite well. Same with a ret. That being said, those comps are certainly not top dogs in the current meta, so you might have a hard time when facing meta comps. Your best bet, if you want to climb the threes ladder, is to learn how to play a rogue mage priest. And I guess that's it for this guide. I hope that it was helpful and that I wasn't too confusing sometimes. I'd appreciate any feedback you may have in the comments, be it positive or negative. Also, keep in mind that if nerfs or buffs happen after I upload this guide, it might change some, some of the stuff I said, mostly regarding the comps. So, have a look at more recent videos from me or anyone else if you have any doubt. Have a good day and see you next time!